thank you all so much for joining today in this um, much needed conversation about Muslim futures in times of crisis regarding the past, present and future iterations of the Red Door project and this ongoing series. Um, I wanna welcome all of you into this space, um, this virtual space. And I also want to acknowledge that um, I am on Peel Up land um, and that this is, um, although we are in the virtual space, I live and work and breathe on ancestral land that belongs to the Peel Up tribe. Um, and I want to pay my respects to elders past and present um, and forthcoming. Um, with that, I will do official introductions as bios, um, that'll be part of how I distribute this. Um, but for now, I just want everybody to kind of introduce themselves and where they're coming from just as a round. Um, and like, we don't have to be super formal um, about this part either. As I said, this is about a conversation and I'm so blessed to have you all um, come into the different um, ways in which the Red Chador has traveled the world and in um, her various trials and tribulations through this. And of course, it's so weird to talk about the Red Tendor when she is also an extension of me and my body and my, my very presence. Um, so let's introduce ourselves. And um, I think we should go chronologically. So I'm going to have um, Annie uh, and then um, Adriel. Noor and then Robert, even though Robert is my oldest friend in here. I do want to put that out there. Wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, firstly, uh, good morning here from London. Uh, it is so nice to see you all. Um, I mean, thank you so much, Anita and Adriel, for this invitation to be part of this conversation. We've had so many invigorating conversations over the years, you know, in so many different places and spaces. So this is a real treat just to be here. So Anita, thank you for all your lovely words earlier, but absolutely it's a joy to be here. And I also am so happy to meet Noor and Robert, knowing that they're connected to you. So I already know we're going to be discovering so many kindred connections through this conversation. So I'm excited. Yeah. And it also feels like a really special time to connect because obviously that's how Adriel and I met many years ago in 2015 as well. But before I kind of go into that, I'll just quickly say a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a curator and researcher. I'm based in London but I work in spaces that kind of look at diaspora trajectories. So looking from Europe, but also looking at Southeast Asia and the various trajectories that one could trace. Um, my work tends to be situated between looking at histories, archives, but also queer identities, feminist theories and communities. So um, at the moment, I also lead a network called Asia Art Activism, which is based in the UK. And we um, try to build community around diaspora and Asian identities uh, in the UK and transnationally. Yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you, Annie. Yay, 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 yay Annie. Um, Hello, everybody. I'm so, so, so overjoyed to get to connect with all of you. I'm so honored. Um, I am Adriel Lewis. Uh, it's evening here. I am in Tavangar, also known as Los Angeles. Um, I've, I've been here since the beginning of the pandemic and um, calling this place home in this period of slowness, of not traveling, of shifting uh, everything that I prioritize my life around has really helped me understand how recognizing the deep history of um, anywhere that I reside and anywhere that I go just helps. Um, it, it's just such, such a guidance. And so, so for example, out here in Los Angeles, I've, um, I, I've taken back to writing um, as a form of recreation, uh, as a form of play, uh, which is which is something that I, I haven't done in a long time, but it's where I met um, met Anita and it's where I met Robert in in that playground. And so I'm I'm just so excited to be here. 
um, to connect with you all around that. Um, a lot of my involvement with the Redshirt Door has been through being a curator at the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. And again, um, my work around there has shifted a lot over the last couple of years, um, connecting deeply into Vangar, connecting deeply with the history in, of Piscataway peoples where um, they now call Washington DC, thinking about the intersection of diaspora and indigeneity um, from a personal standpoint, thinking about my own ancestry coming from Toysan. And I've been lucky enough for some of that to be reflected in my work and in the collaborators that I've been working with too. So I'm so happy to be here with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Adriel. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Nora and I'm super excited to be here. Thank you, Anita, for the invitation. Um, and you know, really happy to be meeting Adriel. We had some communications a few years ago about the Bendigo Art Gallery project and um, nice to meet you too, Annie and um, Robert. So um, likewise, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands um, where I'm meeting from this evening, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. And um, I'd also like to say that sovereignty has never been ceded. And, you know, um, this country, this nation is actually operating on stolen First Nations land. Um, so it's an ongoing sort of, um, you know, uh, I don't want to call it an issue. Um, it's an ongoing reality um, of this of this country, and it does um, often leave, um, you know, people like myself. Um, I migrated here actually just from across the pond um, in New Zealand, but still, you know, for many migrant um, communities, um, especially. You know, if you're coming from a community that's being displaced, you know, then finding yourself on um, colonised land is a really kind of difficult um, place to exist in. And this is something that's a really big conversation here in Australia. Um, we're always having these con conversations, especially through the arts communities. Um, but, you know, of course, I first met Anita back in 2017 in Adelaide um, as part of the a memorial for the Red Chador, um, and we were introduced through a mutual friend, Anita Archer. Um, and, you know, since then, you know, we've sort of um, had lots of conversations um, by email and online, and I was really, um, really honoured, actually, to be able to curate um, kind of like a chronology, a, a mini sort of retrospective of the Red Chador into an exhibition called Soul Fury um, and that was shown at Bendigo Art Gallery between August 2021 and closed just in at the end of January um, this year but more about that a bit later on um, but I'm really pleased to be here and I can't wait to like have uh, this conversation and um, yeah like just really get to know you guys a bit better. Thank you. Great thank you Noor. And then we have Robert. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, really excited to see you all. Uh, Adriel, I don't know. It's been a long time seeing you in a while. Uh, and uh, Annie and Noor, it's really exciting to get to meet you. I've heard so, so many things about you. My name is Robert Farid Karimi. Uh, I am um, currently in the land of the Ohlone, uh, even though the picture behind me is a picture of Chicago. Um, and that's because I'm half Iranian and half Guatemalan. And I understand that I cannot let people know where I'm actually am. And a lot of my work is thinking about the interstitial spaces that we create, uh, in, in front of us, in the present, in the past and in the future. Um, I have known Anita through many, 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 many personas and through many different artistic expressions. Uh, and each one has been exciting and each one has sparked my own work. And I'll talk more about that and to spark a lot of us in our communities. Um, a lot of my work started off with uh, the interstitial, the intersection uh, where different communities around the globe found, uh, found my work about being Iranian, Guatemalan and surviving in the United States as a way to talk about uh, mixed identity and has traversed into work about food fun and games and how we can exchange wisdom with each other. I, I design platforms of playfulness 
so that we can exchange wisdoms with each other uh, for mutual nourishment. And that's uh, a lot of what I'm doing right now. Um, but I, I'm not here to talk about me as much as I'm here to talk about Anita and really just talk about the red Chador. I am officially, if you haven't talk, found out by my color palette, I am the green Chador. So that's why I'm green today. So let's get talking. <laughs> yes, thank you for that. Um, thank you all again for joining me in this conversation. It is really a dream. This is a dream conversation for me. Um, it's almost like I'm giving myself uh, my own crit panel. If you've ever gone through the MFA programs, how brutal that can be, except ours is going to be appreciative and supportive and loving. Um, um, you know, the Red Chador for me began in 2015, and Annie was really there at the beginning of that um, the moment that I sort of gave that idea out into the world and it was in Paris at the Palais de Tokyo. And I always say that, you know, when I create these personas and that's what they are, they're always larger than life heroine figures. And they're always created through a form of, I would say a high, I, I always use the, 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 the terminology, a hybrid form. And that's because it's not just like one moment that creates it. It's always um, a series of different, different um, ways of thinking, being um, the things from my past, and then the present political moment. There's always something about the present political moment um, that goes into the evolution of a work. And in this particular one, it, it was a commission. It was a commission based on the belief that um, the curator was interested in my work and that I could do anything I wanted with the commission. And at that moment, I was thinking about 2014 um, and into 2015. The commission came in 2014, the project launched in 2015. And at that time, we had seen a lot of press, a lot of very bad press about um, Muslim savagery, about the specific use of the word beheadings, um, in headlines related to Muslim identities. Um, we were also seeing in Paris the move to ban the burqa um, in what is a very racist and xenophobic um, series of policies. And then we saw the killings of the Charlie Hebdo caricature artist. And at the time I was in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, where it is a former French colony. And so I was thinking about the legacy of colonialism. And part of that is, is their, the, the, the thing that they left behind that we all know in Southeast Asia is the baguette and bureaucracy. And so I was thinking about that at the same time. And then I was also thinking about, of course, my Islamic identity in relationship to everything and how I grew up uh, with, with the chador. And for, for my family, the chador was a prayer garment that people really wore with respect, with honor, and with joy. But that wasn't the image that was presented to the rest of the world. And so I really began with the question of, if I'm going to be in Paris, I'm going to do something that is going to be critical of what's happening in France, what's happening globally with the image of the Muslim woman, and why can't I celebrate the Muslim woman's um, identity in a really fabulous way? And, and that is really the birth of the Red Chador. And this is my sort of introduction to you, Annie, and how you encountered um, the work and your thoughts um, about it. Uh, I think I should actually mention that um, because I want to speak about my encounter with the Red Chador as both a kind of embodied experience as well as something that I reflected on uh, in a kind of more cerebral space, because I ended up writing an article about you, Anida, uh, in that was published in 2015 or 2016 for uh, Art Asia Pacific, exactly on the fact that, you know, I had first encountered the Buddhist bug and meeting you on, you know, this kind of, um, I don't know, serendipity, you know, this moment when you said, oh, come to Cambodia, <laughs> I've never been. And that took me, you know, from Singapore to Cambodia, where I spent some time with you, 
And it was precisely this alluring kind of enigmatic moment of meeting the bug and encountering that and seeing that performance in 2015 in Singapore, where I met Adriel, which then, you know, following that, uh, when I heard that you were performing a new work, The Red Chador in Paris, uh, and myself, I was going to be in London, I thought, well, I have to be there, you know. So there was something already there, I think, that we can um, draw upon, that there's something about your work, um, something very alluring about this creation of spectacle that itself also returns a gaze, but at the same time is always invitational and warm, and the context can really change the way one reads the work. So I think it was really interesting for us because um, you know, we traveled to um, Paris. I was with my partner then, and it was a springtime, you know, so springtime in Paris is always really beautiful. But at the same time, it was also a very surreal moment because it was the aftermath of the Charlie Hebdo massacre, which was in January, right? So it was with these sort of contradictory um, sense of consciousness of where Paris, would, uh, you know, what, what might be going on in Paris that I entered uh, the city and was trying to track where the Red Chador might be because she had started first on this sort of external promenade, right? And I remember finally managing to catch the Red Chador and interacting with her. I think um, at that moment, she was moving through uh, one of the arrondissements, which is a kind of culturally mixed uh, space. And then we sort of followed her into the metro, the subway. And then we took the subway together, you know, where first, you know, in the suburb, there were sort of strange gazes. People weren't exactly comfortable. They were just kind of looking. And then when we got into the metro, the gaze was both sort of curious and sometimes quite friendly, but not quite sure where to position, um, you know, what this was meant to be. But then really interestingly, when we got to Pigalle, you know, which is the famous street where you know, it is associated with the Moulin Rouge, uh, for a very brief moment, I had a sudden real life, a sudden sort of feeling like, oh, I feel comfortable here for some reason. And there was something about, the Chador's glamour and visibility, you know, and that sort of linked really nicely to a history of performativity and of costume and so on. And I thought how interesting that there was this fluid nature of the Chador as it moved through these spaces all within a very short period of time. And we finally ended up on, I guess, what we would describe as this terrace at the Trocadero, um, where it sort of overlooks, it's quite a famous tourist spot where we would overlook the Eiffel Tower. And when the Chidol got there, uh, first she walked past this group, which turned out to be um, some protesters that were, uh, you know, um, trying to raise awareness about the war in Yemen. And when the Red Chidol moved past the group, suddenly various peoples from the group, you know, shouted out. I, I couldn't really catch what was being said, but it was very friendly. One person even came up, you know, there's a real kind of connection a real uh, you know a real moment of like seeking solidarity and I thought again oh how interesting that they picked up immediately the political angle in which the performance was you know aimed for and then the Chador went down the stairs to the famous balcony you know and again the atmosphere changed <laughs> and I mean I knew that you were a star everyone wanted to be in the photograph with you you know they had no idea what was going on or who the Richard was but they had to be in the photo with her you know and so that was really funny and also it reminded me the same allure that the performance work had um in you know when I first saw your work in Phnom Penh, you know, how um, the Buddhist bug had this ability to bring people uh, around it. And even in Singapore, in its different sort of iterations, um, I noticed this change where families, children, they all felt very safe to gather around. There was such an invitational um, kind of space created by the body of the bug. And similarly here, the Red Chador was fascinating, but not threatening. It was seen as someone friendly. People wanted to be with her, you know, and in some way, it was very interesting. You also made use of that desire that was innate in the audience, the way people are fascinated, I suppose, to some degree with, um, you know, cosplay or with, you know, the um, wax statues at Madame Tussauds, knowing that there's a sense that this is a, a form of celebrity, a form of spectacle, and wanting to be a part of that. Yeah. And so that this was the first journey that we had. 
And then my second encounter with the Red Store was actually within the um, sort of more public areas, the central cupola of the Palais de Tokyo, which is one of the most significant uh, spaces for contemporary art in Paris. And so it was on the occasion, of course, of the a larger program and exhibition that was curated by Kai Hori. And so um, I think, I believe it was a durational performance, right? And so I caught it at various times because it went on all day, right? Late into the night. Yeah. And uh, here the Chador um, was seated at a desk uh, with a chopping board, <laughs> a rather uh, startling uh, cleaver, you know, and then a basket of baguettes all painted in white next to her. And then every hour on the hour, the Chador made a demand, you know, and this demand had to be fulfilled in order to ransom a baguette. Otherwise, the baguette would be beheaded. And I think at first, this uh, created a moment of, of stunned silence. I think when you first announced it, people, the audience was a little bewildered, like, what, what, why, why would you do that? Or, you know, really, is this really going to happen? And, and I think a few of the failed uh, ransom attempts showed that it was going to happen, you know, that the baguettes were going to get chopped up. And, and I remember the demands, um, the span of them, you know, where you asked for halal food to be introduced in the French schools, or that we would have to find 99 virgins, which is impossible at that moment. Um, you know, and so it, it, they spanned something that was more um, sort of quite funny, quite ironic, uh, you know, but clearly was beyond, uh, you know, beyond the possibility of that moment. And then the demands also changed as the day went by. So there was kind of this different reaction of humor, but also um, people getting a little worked up because um, some of the more local audience did have a um, emotional kind of attachment to the symbolism of the baguette. And so they got quite invested into saving the baguette. And I remember coming back to the last few hours of the performance and just sitting there and watching it. And by this time, for some reason, it, it felt collaborative. Um, the demands of the Chador didn't, no longer felt so threatening, perhaps, but it actually brought people to sort of talk to each other. You know, children were running around, speaking to each other, trying to solicit, you know, the answers that um, the Chador was seeking for uh, in exchange for the baguette. I think right at the end, uh, the very last demand, somehow I remember being roped into this circle, this human circle that was linked by holding hands. And it was like, I think it was close to midnight at that time. <laughs> I remember thinking, this is really strange. How do we go from speaking about beheadings to this group of people, strangers, just holding hands and feeling like we're all in this together. And, you know, in, even more wonderfully, um, we managed to get the security guards to participate, to make up the numbers that were needed. You know? So that was really interesting for me, the way the responses to the Trudor shifted, um, the different contexts that helped create different in, uh, inflections of how we read it. And it made me think a lot about how, you know, to some degree, um, the Red Trudor, similar to the Buddhist bug in some way, um, presented a kind of cipher, you know, a very fascinating animatic cipher on which either your fears or fantasies could be projected on, right? But at the same time, within the Palais de Tokyo, there was a kind of agency that, that was enacted that might first have been perceived as a little um, threatening because she was being assertive and making demands. But at the same time, it also had the result of bringing people into dialogue and collaboration. And so the, this experience really lingered with me because of course, you know, not long after that, I think in 2017, you have the executive order 13769. It was implemented, you know, what we call President Trump's travel ban, you know, uh, Muslim ban. And although it was short-lived, it made explicit in legislation exactly that conundrum, right? Like where it is difficult to discuss Islam or Muslim identity without somehow being entangled in geopolitical projections of fear or exoticism, you know, that are often just exercised in national border surveillance or control, right? And yet at the same time, when we think about 
I guess, the longer trajectories and histories of Islam and the way it's developed as a culture, as a community, you know, th these are much longer cross-border histories, you know, in a time where we also have to recognize nations themselves are sometimes relatively new uh, and sometimes arbitrary the way that the, the, the borders have changed, right? So I look forward to discussing all that a little later with you all in terms of Muslim futures. Thank you, um, Annie. That was that was an amazing summary of of what happened. Um, yeah, just that I'm really grateful for um, actually how succinctly you were able to do that. It's been a while since I visited that moment, so thank you for that. Um, so from Paris, uh, we move now because my family physically moved from. Phnom Penh, Cambodia, back to the US and learning to reintegrate into the US um, and having more artistic opportunities there. And instead of leaning on the Buddhist bug, which seemed to be, I think, the easier work, um, you know, especially if you didn't want to get into too much trouble. But what was happening in 2015. I saw the, the rise of fascism in the US in the form of Trumpism. And so uh, my family lands in Hartford, Connecticut because I become a visiting assistant professor in international studies at Trinity College in, in Hartford, Connecticut. And um, I not only have the opportunity to perform on my own campus, but I am um, going to be doing the uh, the next performance in which Adria Lewis curates me into the Smithsonian opportunity, uh, which is part of a um, of a lab. And so I'm going to have him kind of tell us his encounter with the Red Chador in the U.S nation's capital, Washington, DC. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Annie, for that, for that great story. Um, so uh, I've known Anita since 2003 um, through, through poetry. And, uh, and I began uh, curating 10 years later at the Smithsonian. And so a, a couple of years into my into my job um, at the Asian Pacific American Center, we were given this opportunity to curate a weekend long event uh, at the Smithsonian Arts and Industries Building, which is the original US National Museum, like the very first building that the Smithsonian had ever opened. Um, and it was gonna be on Memorial Day weekend, and it was gonna be on, the, uh, on an election year. And so we saw this as really an opportunity to stretch the imagination of what it means to exist within the complexity of America from a global and deep history and, and far future standpoint. Uh, Robert was a part of that as well. Uh, with the Red Shador proposal, there were multiple uh, hostilities that were, that were thrown at the Shador at Anita for concepts that were presented um, having to do with her engaging with the American flag, her engaging with the Bible. Uh, and even before these concepts were brought up, just hostility at the idea of a Muslim woman taking center stage in this crown jewel of a building. So um, I, I wrote a poem uh, in tribute to my relationship with Anita to, to sort of recollect the, the moment. Somewhere between Chicago and DC is where I first glimpsed you. At some point between two tongues and 99 flags, you emerged, shimmering, light on the feet, floating, or maybe levitating, or maybe grounded. What does it mean for a Muslim woman to be viewed as an American patriot? Why the disconnect so profound her mere presence a cause for alarm, a code red, the audacity to handle our flag with those hands 
in that garb, what is it about this museum that led you to believe that you could touch things, speak words, cross this line and I will shut this thing down. I will shut this down. I will shut down all of it should you pry open this closet of bones. Do you remember Shador? You carried it all on your shoulders that weekend in the center of that castle, a sea of white, blue and red fabric wrapped in invisible barbed wire, rolling thunder and circling. The storm that would come later would swallow so many. Entire families mid-flight. Those who dared to step outside to pray. Christ Church. A journalist. Hit with a sniper. Just this week. 51. Palestinian Christian. Born in Bethlehem, in fact. American, in fact. A Jersey girl, in fact who once said, in a specific moment, you forget that fear. Does the world view a Muslim woman by way of religion or by way of race or by way of skin tone or by way of disposition or by way of what they must learn to forget fearing? Shador, while you were up there in that castle as they approached by the thousands, chins tilted upwards, Many wondrous, some weary, a few even in full fatigue. Did you at any point forget that fear? Come to think of it, that was the only time I ever actually saw you in the flesh, adorned in a million sequins, softly breaking the threshold of a nation. They still ask about you, you know. That weekend, the Red Shador roamed one of America's dustiest halls. What did it take to even get her there? They ask. All of it, I respond. They took all of it. Thank you, Adriel. Thank you, Anita. Yeah, thank you. really took me uh, back to that, the enormous uh, challenges. And I think I've said this before in other talks, I think if it was any other curator, I would not have gone to the lengths. I would have stopped when they censored the first version. But I think I held on uh, trusting that uh, that you were going to make something happen and that that was how important it was for that moment to happen in that way on Memorial Day, knowing that rolling thunder was going to take over the streets of D.C. in their fatigue and their patriotism, right? Um, and that yeah. why we have this this little corner, this little rotunda. Yeah, yeah. For for context, Rolling Thunder is was the was the sanctioned precursor to the insurrection. It was basically like an, an organized annual gathering of um, far right wing uh, motorcyclists that literally were circling the National Mall, which um, the venue for Cross Lines was at the center of. And so while the Red Shadors at the center of the National Mall, you've got this brigade of Trumpians, um, you know, in 2016, uh, weeks before the primary election, just like encircling her. Yeah, yeah, that is the perfect description of exactly what happened. Um, so from Washington, D.C., the Red Chador went to many, many other places uh, before her unfortunate demise in 2017 uh, after um, having, after myself, having a very difficult time getting into Palestine, into Ramallah, Palestine, where I was simply going to be giving a talk 
the Red Chador was actually in transit from the Kuala Lumpur uh, Biennale to which she did uh, perform at and make an appearance. It was their first ever Kuala Lumpur Biennale and the Red Chador, you know, had an exhibition and a performance in front of thousands of people um, because it was such a huge turnout uh, for that event. And um, so I was actually in transit uh, with the original costume, along with some other gifts I had bought in Kuala Lumpur because my children still remind me that they never got their gifts since that was also taken. Uh, the, so my um, child's sparkly Hello Kitty shoes were with the Red to the Work garment in a luggage. Um, we made it into uh, Palestine. And of course you have to go through Israel. You have to go through um, Tel Aviv uh, to get to Ramallah. And um, I was detained uh, upon arrival. I was strip searched prior to getting on the plane. Um, and so I, I really was prepared that this was going to be a difficult trip. Um, then I, I did my speaking engagement. Again, the garment itself was in the luggage. I had not planned to take it out at all. Um, and then I left the country. Um, upon leaving, I remember getting a lot of messages in my inbox saying, hey, if you, if you took any footage or if you have anything on your hard drives, you might want to uh, mail that home. Um, I'm not sure if if you're going to have difficulties with your media, um, and I didn't I didn't think anything of it. I I said no, I don't have much. I didn't do much of it. Give a, a talk. I I don't I don't think I'll have any problems. I hadn't thought about my other items. Um, I left, and unfortunately, when I got back, um, I did not. Um, half half of my there were two luggages and one luggage never returned and it was the one with the red to door and the sparkly hello kitty shoes and my parents lamp that had I think Allahu and Muhammad on them so another um, gift from um, the Malaysians and that didn't make it home either um, and when I tracked it you know um, it was clear it, it was gone it disappeared there was no record of it, except that the last place that it was tracked to was in Tel Aviv. And my route was from Tel Aviv to Istanbul, to Chicago, to Seattle. So clearly it was never gonna make it out of there. It's very, um, it's very easy to look me up. I have a public profile. It's very easy to see the correlation between that work and um, my, my very agitative, um, presence and the work that I do um, in response to the political moment. So that was December 2017, and I had lined up all these exhibitions around the world for 2018. And um, one of them was in Adelaide as part of the Oz Asia Festival. And instead of going there and performing, um, I was pretty traumatized and just trying to grieve this loss. And this is in a chain of other losses. If you've seen me give other talks about the various things that have happened to my works, um, this is just sort of the straw that really broke me. Um, and this is where I encountered Noor Shkembi and um, she will now discuss the memoriam and maybe even talk about the expectations because it was such a different work and and you know and i'm not sure how i feel about that work i think i just felt like i had to fill that gap and this was the only thing i could do um, because i wasn't going to recreate it at that time thanks anita um yeah i I'm still pretty emotional from Adriel's um, contribution. Um, yeah, just, you know, and, and on that, I, I feel like the memorial um, was kind of surreal um, for me as a Muslim woman um, and thinking about, you know, the disappearance of the Red Chador 
and what that represented and what that actually means in terms of the violence that's enacted in the name of, you know, um, Muslim women. Um, you know, the way that the veil is politicised and, you know, for me, like being at that memorial and, you know, like being present with you while you were mourning, you know, the red chador made me realise how, you know, like here you are as a performer with so much gravitas and so much presence and power in what you do. But at the same time, for me, I was watching you and, you know, like I couldn't untangle the reality of the red to door from the performance because it's a reality for us, right? So, you know, I guess um, for me experiencing that, um, you know, like I, I, I mean, obviously, you know, looking at your work as an art historian or a curator is very different to experiencing your work as a Muslim woman as well. And, you know, understanding that entanglement um, for you, that this type of abject subjectivity is so very essential in art practice. And I think it's really important as well for curators to um, work within that concept and space, you know, because we're often told that, you know, you need to be objective, it needs to be all, you know, academic and intellectualised and you're removed from it. But that's sort of, again, you know, part of this colonisation of people, of ideas. Um, to me, that's like an extension of Orientalism where what you are experiencing, what you're saying, what you're making, what you're feeling um, has to be, I guess, like verified or told through the white lens before it's considered, um, you know, valid. Um, so I feel like, yeah, the memorial was so much about that entanglement um, and I think that's where the power lay in that work and it also you know for me um really kind of made me think about um the violence and you know the way that the red chador has kind of you know like you you've had these you know performances you know all these different iterations of the red chador and a lot of that's been done in silence but the power in that, you know, and just the way that the Richardor herself um, contains that. It's, it's yeah, it's like the hyper-presence of um, the Muslim woman figure in the public domain. And I think, yeah, like there's all of these sort of things going on um, that are really powerful and really um, important. And, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, thinking about the rebirth, like what came after the Red Chador um, Memorial is almost like something that's unreal. Like it was like up until that point, it was grounded in so much reality. It then sort of flipped over into... Um, this fantastical, you know, um, you know, incredible kind of unreal um, moment, you know, with the multicoloured chadors. So, yeah, I, I kind of feel like the memorial in a way um, probably did act as a threshold, um, like a point of you being able to... Um, flip this into something else. You, you are able to take this into a different um, direction. And, you know, although kind of having that fantastical, you know, um, playfulness to it, um, it's still those words entanglement, um, are, like it's still there, that it's still somehow like rooted in reality. Um, and, again, that type of subjectivity in your performance is, yeah, like what's really, really compelling. Um, and just to sort of bring us back to 
the memorial, I wanted to um, read back to you um, something that you wrote um, that really kind of hit me in the heart. Um, and this is what um, that you had written about the Red Chidor um, and her disappearance. You, my dearest Red Chador, were always at risk. And we know that every disappearance violates a range of human rights. I, Anita Yu Ali, am the only surviving kin to the Red Chador. She lived a life of international mystery, veiling herself in silence and red sequins. But in her silence, she spoke truth to power, reflected people's fears, anxieties, uncomfortable gawkings, and occasionally joy and humour onto themselves. They were the unsuspecting public, everyday people in daily urban settings going about their day in Kuala Lumpur, Hong Kong, Seattle, Seattle, Tacoma, San Francisco, Washington, D.C., Hartford, Paris. I have nothing left of the Red Chador. No physical remains, no more red boots, no veil, not even one sequin. I don't even have enough words to own this moment of pain and loss. It is as if I have returned to the nothingness to which started my entire refugee experience, arriving with nothing but the clothes on our backs. But that's not exactly true because I, as the performer, embodied her. She lived through me. So I'll just, I'll end on that um, and hand back. I wrote that. <laughs> that was, oh gosh, I haven't. I haven't visited that eulogy again. It just, it feels so, so, so long ago, even though, you know, it wasn't that long. It was 2018. So that's like four years ago, but I feel like because we're all caught in this global pandemic, it just that, that moment before the pandemic felt like almost a decade ago when, yeah. when it wasn't when it wasn't, it was actually very recent. Um, so thank you for reminding me of, of those, those words and that sorrow, because it was a really deep sorrow and I'm, I'm yeah. so tired of the sorrow and the loss. And, and so I'm looking forward to the second half of this, um, if, if anything, of, of a little bit more joy. Um, and this is a good point, like in terms of the rebirth of this work, um, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly how it happened, but I think that this is why so many of us are artists is it's the only thing we can do. It is, it is, it is part of our breath. Um, we make because we have to, uh, we create because that is the only thing we can do. We were born to that. Um, and so the decision to rebirth was, was a difficult one. I really thought with the memoriam that I was going to, you know, put an end to it. Um, and maybe it was, it was because I was so tired. Um, the opportunity to rebirth really came in the form of another commissioning residency with the Shangri-La Islamic Museum of um, Art Culture. Um, and design. And it was an opportunity in Honolulu, Hawaii, um, which is a really interesting sort of point of reference for the rebirth because um, Hawaiian legislators were one of the first to resist the executive order to stand up against Trump, against the Muslim ban. It is also at the very far end in many ways of the reach of empire, of the US empire. And so I felt like there were so many things that were pointing and I'm always looking, and this is maybe the faith part of me, I'm always looking for these signs from the divine that, that I'm meant to do this, that I need to do this. Give me the signs, like give me the reasons um, to keep going because you know when you're dealing with, um, conversations about religion, oftentimes they point to that very thing, which is like, you know, that it's sacrilegious to do that. And so um, I needed these signals, uh, 
from a higher entity or from the way the universe um, offers you things when you put your intentions out there. It's almost always for me, things um, get delivered. Um, you just have to pay attention to the to those to those um, poetic signs. And so the other other thing was as I was talking to Adriel, in fact, he reminded me of the importance of the Anunu um, with Hawaiian people, the rainbow, the imagery of the rainbow. Um, and um, the rainbow is, in, is a, a graphic that's on all the license plates, but it's also about this, um, this, this pathway, this, this connection to celestial bodies. And so I thought, well, this is it. I have been thinking about multiplying the presence of the red door, that if I was to rebirth the work, she would not be alone. She cannot be alone. And my first version of this was to create 99 of the red to door. So multiplying the red to door nine, uh, in 99 ways. And then I thought, no, that's too easy. If I'm going to come back and I'm going to address Islamophobia, I need to align with other issues, with other communities that are very important to me. And I thought, well, this is a way to open up our community. Or, or if, if I'm going to talk about religion, I need to talk about um, some of the issues that I have with Islam that are very personal to me. And so for me, it was about aligning um, Islamophobia with issues of homophobia and looking at, you know, internally within our own community uh, in a way uh, that was going to sort of honor um, how how I move in the world, which is through solidarity, which is through um, an openness and an acceptance of, uh, of many, many critical issues. Um, and so we have the rebirth in the form of Genesis 1, which began in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, and that iteration was um, uh, six other chadors in the rainbow spectrum color and being really intentional about using that but not limiting it just to queer identity really honoring it as a vibrancy as um you know a, a, a sense of joy i mean you cannot look at that collection of colors and not find some sense of joy um and so I would receive a second opportunity to bring the work back to life uh, in Bellevue, Washington on the 20th anniversary of 9-11 in 2021. Um, and I ask my good friend, Robert Fareed Karimi to be one of the six Chadors. Um, and I would love it, Robert, if you could talk about your experience um, having to sort of be part of the journey on 9-11, which I know holds significance to you as well as a Guatemalan Iranian. Um, yes, Robert. Yes. Um, before I go into there though, um, thank you everybody for everything you said. I've been writing it down a lot because one of the things that hit me is that um, the, I'm going to get a little uh, emotional, but a little theoretical as well. Um, I'm a performance artist. Uh, I did. I know I didn't say that earlier. I'm a poet. And I say this because I've been connected with Anita through those ways. But also now I'm a professor of uh, performance practices um, um, at Arizona State University. And what I'm finding it fascinating as we're talking is I always find it a trip uh, that we don't get connected uh, especially people of color performance artists connected to art historicalness enough. And I was just writing down how um, on, on the art, art side, how this work is connected to Adrian Piper's work. It's connected to Coco Fusco, now Bustamante, Amatis Motavali. These are, might be names you know or don't know, but I'm, I'm thinking about it because um, I realize those artists deal with exertion 
And as a Nita's friend, one of the pieces of this that as I'm listening to the journey, I got the phone calls when the Chador was lost. I got the phone calls when she's thinking about things with Adriel or talking to Annie. I, I, and I'm thinking about the emotional pain that many performance artists endure of exertion that to make this art to be considered part of the canon. But the person that came to mind, and I don't know if you all know this person, is James Luna, the indigenous artist who put his body on the line on a table to be observed in an art museum, and but with humor. And to me, that's the red chador. Its weapon is humor. And, and it sucks because the artist has to go through so much to make us laugh, to make us smile. Um, but I just see a kinship in this work as in that way. And I just wanted to bring that out there, Anita, because um, I'm also at this time thinking, because Annie said this word so much, allurement, you know, this idea, and it's a term that Roberto Bedoya and I came up with called radical allurement. Um, this idea that you use food, fabric and fun to allure the, art, the audience to participate. And the fabric of those sequins, the fabric of it, you know, and the food is Anita just standing there, as Annie stated, like, you know, you just see the shiny spectacle thing and you're like, ooh, what's that? I want to, I'm into it. And then it's fun. That's what the kids, you know, so I'll, I'll talk about that with the, with this. But also the other final thing I want to say is me being a part of Red Chador in Bellevue is about Anita's commitment to community as she builds her own career, her own artistry. That's from when she was in her poetry group, uh, helping to be one of the founders of the Asian American Spoken Word Summit, all the way to my, my invitation into the Smithsonian Lab is, you know, my connection to her. And all the way to now, here I am putting on, on 9-11, I'm putting on a green chador. And on 9-11-2001, I wrote an essay about being scared. My, my father, the very first day of 9th, the first, within the first 30 minutes of us understanding it, my father forcing me to shave before going outside and not letting me be outside because he feared my death. And my mother from Guatemala said the same thing. They feared that knowing civil war, knowing CIA interventions, and the chaos that ensues during political times, they were afraid for my death. And the first action was to shave. And so when Anita said, let's do this on 9-11, <laughs> I was scared for her. And I was, I, and she can remember this. I, I was so frightened because I had no idea what could happen to us. And I have to tell you, um, what was interesting was for me that hit me, the first thing that hit me was I was the only man. Only, only male facing person in the room. I was changing with women in, in, into a chador. And it hit me. It hit me the privilege. I was welcomed into secret language. I was welcomed into um, um, really uh, being allowed to just be part of the team, part of the kin, part of the family. In a way, um, you know, Islam has its segregations and its splits and, and just the way, so simply the gesture of that, that Anita did was, was a blessing. And it made me feel safe. Um, and when I put the chador on, the beginning of the, of the transformation of my safety started to occur. occur. I could feel the embodiment. I was no longer a Muslim man. I was no longer the terrorist. I was no longer the target. I was no longer the Iranian. I was the human being inside the Chador. And weirdly, I was safer in the Chador than I would be if I didn't have it on. And I was like, the minute we walked out the door, all of a sudden, and I saw the colors, and I saw us walk through, and I saw the, the performance of the museum, I could do anything. I could be anybody. I know that this is not what the symbol means. I know we can have a long talk 
um, you know, about Islam and the Chador and the history of the hijab, burqa, all of that. But in the in that moment, I felt free. That's my experience. And what in, in the United States, it it I never even thought of being in a Chador, but it was kind of like um, um what I talk about when Iranians and other folks change their names, you know, to be more anglicized. That's what it kind of felt like, but this was way different. When we walked out on the street and people were looking at us, I really thought, oh man, that's it. We're out. They're going to, you know, but what first started happening startled me. Women in, um, in chadors themselves or burqas or were wearing that were Muslim identifying in the mall that we walked into turned away from us. They did not want to be connected to us. And I was unclear about what that meant. Like I could not identify, but that was the first other startling thing that started to happen. They did not want to be near the rainbow, <laughs> the rainbow to doors walking in. And, and people approached us, lots of children approached us. But I want to take us, I could, I could go point by point by point, but the place I really want to center the conversation is when we walk to the playground in Bellevue. And when we walk to the playground in Bellevue, I've got the, I got the play by play of what happened before we walked in. But a, some of the mothers was this full playground. Imagine this full play, playground with kids, brand new in a park, just this incredible, beautiful playground. And we're just walking walking in the formation that Anita asked us to, making this beautiful shape, uh, just, and at that moment, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm even starting to feel, I'm, I'm feeling a little Disney-like. I feel a little, not that I feel like Goofy or Mickey Mouse, but I'm feeling very character-like at that moment. Like, ooh, I can, you know, start saying hello to people. And when we get to the playground, my partner told me this story, the mothers, some of the mothers stiffened. And we're like, oh, hell no, this is not happening. And, and they, start, they started listening to them freak out at these rainbow. And the children are like excited. They're like, oh, something's coming. And, and, and at that point, I mean, that could be anything that they're thinking. We're Sesame Street. We're reading Rainbow, whatever PBS concoction or TV shows in their head. They, you know, maybe we're Muslim Teletubbies. Who knows what's in their head? They are excited. And mothers, I don't know how many Anita blocked us. Was it three, four, two? Tried to block two, tried to block us from coming in. And we and 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 the kids were like, woo! And I remember I I just avoided the women blocking us. And I got on the seesaw. It was a four-person seesaw. And every child started jumping on the seesaw with me as if wherever I went was a call to action of joy. Oh, we're going to play wherever the green chador is. Oh, yeah. Wherever the green chador is on the slide, that's where we're going to go. And it was as each one started, some of them started picking their favorite colors to hang out with, come play with me. And this, this was the, this is the work right there where a simple gesture leads to this playfulness. They can see it, the sequence, the, the, the perfect art direction of Anita is she's thinking of every detail to the sequence, to the shape of our bodies, to the colors. And some people might go, well, you know, that was random and chance. No, that happened because the artist understood how to bring people in. And I think it was either Annie or Noor that said it earlier. That idea, that allurement, and that bringing people in for that joy, they get it on a subtextual, subconscious level. And even, even with this, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll end with this part, there were young girls that would run after and give us flowers in gratitude. A Russian family ran down to give us flowers out of gratitude. And how many, I mean... I'm talking about, you know, okay, I'm sorry, and I know you want to be an agitator and you want to agitate, but that, that type of gesture of agitation that leads to a child giving you a flower, 
that's amazing revolution. That's that's amazing subversion when you end with a flower and not a fist. And I think that that's what that experience taught me in 9-11. Yeah, thank you, Robert, for that. I mean, I mean, I think the biggest, the biggest takeaway, and this is exactly how I phrase it, was um, the children disarmed the situation for the adults. The adults who should have known better were scared, were dismissive, and were hurtful with the way they encountered the chadors while the children in the same area were excited, were playful, wanted engagement and interaction, dismissed their parents and went for it, you know, with the flowers, with the curtsies. I don't remember if you remember the curtsies that we got with the gesture, the returning of the the gestures beyond the gaze. I mean, they just really went for it. And I think we, we needed that. We needed that because it was such an assault when the, the two women who, who tried to block our entry and then gave our production assistant a very difficult time. Um, and then they also said some, some mean stuff about the, the mayor since, since it was funded by the city of Bellevue, they made some sort of comment and then they had yanked their own children out of the playground and sort of, you know, moved, moved elsewhere or, or out. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, I, I think that for me, the work and the rebirth of the work is about being in community because again, the death for me felt like such a lonely way to go that I was not going to repeat that, that this for me was about making sure other people saw us and could feel the energy that I feel almost every time I, um, you know, I, I embody and put on um, the fabric. Um, I wanted other people to experience that, that joy, that presence, take ownership of that moment, and then spread those stories that in their retelling, she continues to live in these different iterations, with these different colors, creating different moments and different experiences. And that's just really important um, for this. Um, and so I know we're at an hour over an hour now and we're completely to, failed we're, we're not even in the future yet oh my god <laughs> so I just we're, ha we're about halfway done so if you have another hour and a half of your time we're just <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, i was wondering if maybe we can have a final like 20 minutes what do you all think um about that about pushing to about 20 minutes more on this um and I'm sure we can edit this part out if need be. Um, really, it's it's about just us having an open conversation um, about different points of what others have said and then moving into, um, you know, I, I want to be able to share out with you sort of the future, future possibilities of this work. Um, but before we get there, let's just honor this present moment. Um, and so many things were said and I've taken notes myself. Um, so let me just check in with you all. What do you, what do you think about hearing from everybody else and, and what you all must be feeling from your different vantage points? I feel like everything that um, each of you have described, I kind of saw in a microcosm at the Bendigo Art Gallery. So like, um, the exhibition um, Soul Fury, we dedicated an entire like gallery, like a room to Anita's work. And there was like a chronology of the performance stills. So all of the um, uh, performances that uh, you've just spoken about and then sort of ending with the rebirth um, and the video in Honolulu and a couple of larger scale um, images from that work. And... Um, it, it's quite a distance away from where I live, the Bendigo Art Gallery, but I did manage to get um, up there um, back and forth a couple of times and I would kind of just 
sit around in that room to watch how people were interacting with the work. Um, as curators do, you sort of incognito walk through the space and kind of watch how the audience responds to the exhibition. And it was interesting that um, there was almost like, you know, like this serious demeanour um, as people were looking at, especially like the Paris works, DC, and kind of really trying to figure out what's going on. And then that sort of move around the room and end up, um, with the rainbow, um, red chidors, and they would like stick around and actually watch. They watched the whole video out. They didn't just kind of stand there for a few seconds and then like move on out of the gallery. Um, and again, it's the, that word, Annie, that you used earlier, um, and Robert, the allure, the joy. Uh, people were laughing, you know, they're kind of nudging each other. Hey, like, see that bit? You know, like they, were, they actually became animated and really engaged with that work. And I think, again, that sort of idea of humour um, that's in your work came alive. And I'm not sure if it's because that was a video and, you know, they could see the movement and the performance um, as opposed to the stills of the performances or if it was the subject matter like that the rainbow um, colours were there. And um, so, yeah, like it was interesting seeing audience response. Um, I had quite a few people sort of reach out and contact me to talk about um, the exhibition and all of them spoke about the Red Chidor. Um, and, you know, it was really odd, and I've mentioned this to Anita um, previously, that the demographic of, um, you know, audience that was really engaged with the Red Chidor were young men. I was so surprised with that. I was so, so surprised. Um, and they really got the humour and the audacity um, of the Red Chador and what you were doing. And they really engaged in that and were kind of really excited about it when they were talking to me about it. Um, I don't understand the psychology behind it or know exactly why, but there was this repeated audience type that really engaged um with the work and that really sort of struck me thinking about the red to door in the future um you know like who is your target um audience you know or you know is red to door you know there's something that you feel you need to do or say or a way that you need to be and that audience will change um so yeah just sort of putting that out there that yeah just sort of being a fly on the wall, I guess, and watching the responses, but also having those conversations um, with people. And some of my students um, went up to the gallery to visit and every single student, um, and I always ask, you know, so, you know, what work spoke to you? What was your favourite work? And all of them said Red Chidor. Um, and these were always young males that said that. So, yeah, just interesting Um from a yeah curator's perspective and yeah just maybe for you as well sort of taking that in um I don't know if maybe they feel like removed the most removed from that experience and that's why they can kind of just enjoy it um as opposed to feeling invested um, you know, you, you always have that kind of audience or just people in general that feel really invested in like telling you what Muslim women should be doing, what they think about the veil. You know, they, they want to have a say about this. Um, I'm not quite sure, but, you know, something to maybe unpack a little further. Yeah, I think I, I'd like to sort of jump in there. Firstly, thank you so much, Adriel, Noor and Robert. It's really uh, exhilarating to, to hear your responses and your recollections that, um, because I, I was there at the beginning, but obviously you've really brought to life the journey and um, all the twists and turns in the story and narrative. Uh, I think I wanted to pick up first, there are the three points I wanted to discuss. So the first one is something, Robert, you spoke about, about how um, it is still, it is still a, a niche uh, sector to create art histories around performance. 
and performance being something that's more ephemeral. Although we do document the experience of performance, it's not always uh, captured through documentation so well, right? So I think this is something that is so interesting to think about in terms of the future, in terms of like future generations, understanding this moment, understanding the significance of the work. And, you know, it was really interesting, of course, Anita, we're connected through another um, aspect of this, right? Because um, in some sense, there is also a lack of understanding of work beyond the Euro-American canon within the UK and Europe. And so that began, you know, the work of, you know, the research that we did to collect information and knowledge around performance conditions in Cambodia. And then that led to to the building of the Southeast Asia Performance Collection. And then, you know, it was sort of, um, it became this generative uh, collection of knowledge of materials that then led to the archive exhibition uh, at the House de Kunz, where we were able to invite you, Anita, to make a performance of the Buddhist bug there, you know. And it was interesting because it was, um, it occurred to me like how that was seen as a sort of landmark event because there, there was an accompanying conference, you know, which then led, of course, to the recent publication of Southeast of Now, which tries to uh, capture some of the, that uh, knowledge around performance histories, around um, different ideas of performativity from the region, right? But otherwise, it remains a very niche subject area. And I also think that how knowledge, when not exercise, we're not activated, right, can recede from consciousness. And that is how, in some way, you know, why mainstream narratives continue to persist because funding and attention are placed on them, right? So that's something that I think is worth considering when we think about future. And certainly, no, I share your um, attentiveness to education in that respect, because um, and your work features um, very heavily, thank you, I draw upon it, uh, for my course that I teach on performance, um, you know, which is called um, uh, The Body, Place and Politics, uh, which I teach at Central St. Martins in London. And it's also really interesting, the number of students that respond really warmly to the work, uh, probably because I talk a lot about it, but, you know, the number of essays that then come out of it. And I think, oh, and also the interesting thing that they tell me that because in most institutions in the UK, um, the opportunity to access such work is still very limited. So diaspora students, uh, students from the global south would naturally gravitate to certain modules for the opportunity to look at a wider canon. You know? So I think this goes back to the same question. When we think about art history, uh, art history is really also a question of the future. You know, what future narratives, mm -hmm. what future ideas of lineage do we draw upon, right? Are we always reinventing the wheel and spending all this effort, you know, rediscussing our issues of representation again and again, when actually is also beyond those very constraints of representation that we talk about, right, which are wrapped up in other issues of funding and sometimes self-exploitation for the sake of representation. So we can really dig a hole down that you know, <laughs> journey, right? Um, but moving beyond that, I think the second thing I really want to talk about is that uh, there is a real intersection in the work of Retrodor um, here that we can think about, of course, Muslim identity, but also a feminist agency that's so present in your work. You know, uh, I think, yeah, it, it's funny that the title of that first article I wrote about you was about, was called Artist Provocateur, because it really was you encapsulating that energy, the agitative uh, energy for change, a kind of creative activism. And you speak so powerfully about that as well, because, you know, when you gave your paper, which was also following your trajectory as an artist at House de Kunz, you know, it was incredibly uh, moving, I think, you know, the response to that. And so we were so fortunate that you then uh, could recreate some of that into the paper that you, um, that is now in that volume, right? So if, I feel like yeah, we feel so gratified. We've, we've managed to capture some of the, your voice, you know, for posterity or for future, you know, in thinking about that. But it's really interesting when we think about feminist agency, because I was having a conversation recently, uh, you know, after listening to just the artist Jesse Jones, you know, talk about uh, alternative knowledge and alternative feminine power and thinking about how 
uh, within some theoretical conceptualizations of Southeast Asia, we tend to equate the idea of feminine energy with the land. You know, uh, there are many kind of origin uh, stories about countries that, for example, equate like the feminine energy with the Naga and therefore the Naga is related to the land and so on. And then usually the masculine energy is the, the cosmopolitan moving figure, like the Brahmin or something like that. You know, so there's a really interesting sort of separation of uh, where these genders are placed. And something Jesse said also struck me was that um, through the archetypes that she had been investigating in her work, she found that every time women tried to ascend, right, and this takes me back to Adriel's beautiful poem about, you know, the Chidora seeming to levitate, that seems to rise, that seems to ascend because it refuses to be suppressed and refuses to be um, covered over, right, it wants to be visible. You know, that's where the alarm happens, right? That's where the, the fear happens. Because every time women try to ascend beyond where they're the seemingly supposed to be positioned, that's where, you know, um, other types of oppressions happen, right? Witch trials and so on and so on, right? So there's a really interesting um, history here to be further uncovered about where we see women in relation to a kind of structure of power. Like at what point do they... Uh, are they allowed to be positioned, you know? And I think coming back then to this idea of radical Leoman Robert, I love the way you put that together. Because, uh, you know, recent, there, there is a, a current exhibition at the moment in Features to Red Door. And I remember standing in this very beautiful uh, exhibition environment in West London, very posh. And, you know, the draw is on a mannequin looking absolutely fabulous. And all the gallery visitors came in and demanded to be, you know, photographed with the chidor. Um, and it was very interesting because right next to that, you have the placards that say, ban me and so on, right? And it, there was sort of no acknowledgement of that. Everyone just wants to be photographed, right? Um, and yet, you know, within the UK, we have similar uh, prejudice in terms of surveillance, in terms of, you know, other kind of social um, access, right? And it made me think about how this radical allure, in some way, is a kind of seduction, because it's a seduction for someone to come to the door, want to be photographed, and in that act of revealing the fact that they're seduced, it's also the time when they are acknowledging, in some way, that they're complicit. Yes. Yeah. Right, because there is that power power dynamic of being both seduced and then fearing the seduction because of, the, of its power. So I think there's something really powerful that's happening there that makes us rethink why we want to be seen with the chidor or not. Right, this this whole tangle or this tangle, you know, of movement with the chidor uh, that is making me want to further consider like how we respond, how we speak of her, how do we keep this dialogue going? Yeah, so I'll just pause it for now. Yeah, so that's, yes, I, the London show that is currently on. Um, so interesting because um, I, I've been hearing from the curators about um, sort of their, the fascination with that, that room in particular with the red to the door and then the the photograph of the abbey road homage there which was done in bellevue with robert creamy and the other chadoras um and you know little did we know that we were going to get a london show um and so that that is now on the cover of different art newspapers and you know all sorts of websites and stuff um and i you know, when you talk about London and Londoners in the UK, I mean, you have to talk about the colonialism and and sort of the the damaging effects of that in in so many Muslim majority countries and that continuation, and then all of the brown bodies that exist in the UK that are under heavy surveillance and scrutiny and death threats, and then ultimately demise. Um, so I think this, the Chador's, you know, being in these contested spaces, because that's what it is. You talk about it as like an entanglement with 
this notion of playing with spectacle and radical allurement, and that's all intentional. I, I very much know the stereotype that I'm playing with, and I very much know the aesthetics that I'm also playing with. And I am toting the line between humor and joy and seriousness and politics. Um, there is no better way to pull people into the conversation about politics and religion, when you're, which you're not supposed to do at dinner tables, but there's something about the, the aesthetics that for me, I intentionally place out there in order to persuade. I was going to use the word persuade, but I think it's a, it's lure. It's literally luring them into this and having them figure out the active witnesses figure out their place in it, their positionality. I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's the reason why she doesn't speak. The only time she spoke was during the ransom that was in 2015 at the Palais de Tokyo. That was the only time um, she has never spoken since. Um, so that's interesting. And then I think I just, I want to shift us into the realm of the future um, of this work. And um, so I'm glad that we were able to talk about the current, the like the piece right now is in London, like the Chador is there, the Chadoras um, in photographic form and video form are there. Um, and then my idea for Muslim Futures is really about, you know, existing unapologetically on my own term, on our terms as Muslim people and as people around Muslim people and really asserting ourselves um, and, and our ways of being and knowing in the world without being afraid of, of being angry, of being seen as strange, as othered, as dangerous, or maybe we want to be dangerous on our own terms. And, and this is what I was alluding to in the very beginning of this, which is, you know, do I get to be, and do I get to show anger that doesn't come off as something that is going to be offensive because of the perception and the stereotypes um, around this image that is already placing my body in unsafe ways. Um, I'm very interested in that because I'm thinking, and this is where the humor part comes in. I'm thinking about that that uh, that movie, The Attack of the 50 Foot Woman. It's an old, like 1950s, 1960s, um, um, uh, it's a, a B movie with the sort of lo-fi sci-fi aesthetics. And, and I'm thinking it's going to be the attack of the 99 foot red chador um and um i'd like to create some miniatures and just um have her you know innocently walk around and suddenly knock down the eiffel tower or something i'm not sure yet but that is that's one iteration of that and then at the same time i'm interested in creating some other miniatures to create this cinematic piece where she is traversing through different planes of possibly like seven layers of heaven and seven layers of hell. And then at some point you really can't tell hell and heaven, they could kind of merge um, at times. Um, so like more fantasy, um, a little bit more along the lines of the kind of um, aesthetics um, I'm dreaming of. And then my collaboration with um, Robert Fareed Karimi and our adventure into um, something that we're working on, which is called um, Haramabad. And that is something we've been scheming and pulling together and finding our place in it. And, and, and you know, you can bet our sort of um, uh, ways of embodying the red and the green chador might resurface in that. I don't know if you want to talk about that, Robert, as um, part of our Muslim futures. I I, I, I was hoping Adriel would go next, but I'll do it. <laughs> I don't know why I would, because he's yellow, like yellow to door. Uh, <laughs> um, um, but um, yeah, I, I want to say, going directly with your question, and I'll connect it to Haramabad, that I see the red Chador and its latest creation, the, the rainbow, <clears throat> um, 
<clears throat> as a prism and a bridge to the future. Um, I think I, I started writing down words that everybody said at different moments. And I think the, the prism that it's, or the bridge that it's carrying are, is this language, the, uh, when we talk about Muslim future, because I'm looking for a Muslim future that has a, audacity, fabulousness, humor, absurdity, not precious, family, collaborative, uh, spectacle, sparkle, and sassy. Um, and it is because um, for me, the Muslim future is a Muslim future of resilience and that our imagination and the imaginary that we hold has been used by the French in a thousand and one nights and other places um, our saints, our, our, our martyrs, our everything are used by governments to kill people and send them to war like in Iran. And it's just amazing, even if we think about jinn, even if we think about all the things within our mythologies and magic, that they all are things that we as people, uh, and I say this as Muslim, the constructed Muslim, the intellectual Muslim, whatever blank Muslim you put yourself in, it's part of how we how we stay alive and for me that's the muslim future i want to be about as an artist and i see the red shador as that symbol of that survival of the bridge and then the prism into the color of haramabad because it i mean for me haramabad is the place of the misfit um i i one of the things that I find kinship with Anita is the work I did called Cards Against Iranians, Syrians, the whole list on the Muslim ban where I took the Cards Against Humanity, which is a popular game here, and made a game night where I took out the black cards and put my own in that subvert the game and make people make fun of Muslims in front of Muslim and Muslim comedians and during a game night. And it's funny that word complicit comes up. How can we make people part of the game rather than our bodies always on the line to get people to understand what we're going through. And I think uh, with Haramabad, we're thinking about that. We're going to think about how we can, what's the world like of Muslim misfits? Where's the place where we can joy and dance? And, and is it where we play these crazy games? Is it where the red chador is, the green chador? Uh, is it where, uh, you know, uh, I, this character I have called Farid Mercury is like, well, who's, who's there, where we all are and will, how, how, how do we, you know, how, is it constructed as a place, a safe haven for us during a time where things aren't getting any better? And so I think the red Chador is that spark and that call to action. And I, at least for the Muslim future that I'm hoping we all can be a part of. Yeah, and, and Noor, we're looking at you and the Eleven Collective and all of that because I know there are misfits and outcasts there. They need to be part of Haramabad and, and you know, wherever we're going to take that uh, with this. Um, I think it's it's exciting to dream. It always is. Um, and so I'm I'm invested in that, in, in making these these dreams, these artistic dreams sort of manifest. Um, and yeah, it's that's an exciting place to be. I think, uh, I know we started with a lot of loss and a lot of um, sort of reminiscing about um, different encounters, but it's also nice to um, kind of end on this uh, note of imagination and of um, future thinking and and knowing that it's it's very much rooted in the present and as you said annie history is also not just about looking back it's looking it's looking to the future um which is a is a different approach to this um adriel i just wanted you to see as the yellow chador there in your <laughs> um if you wanted to to end us with any thoughts and we can also just do another really short like round Robin, kind of ending thoughts. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Anita and Annie and Robert and Nerd. I uh, really appreciate just getting to reminisce a lot. It, it really uh, beautifully paints this picture of the Red Shador beginning with being a concept and now has become legend. And um, I think that, that that evolution is an embodiment of the kind of future that I see. 
I think listening to these stories, it occurred to me that the wretched door is a rare opportunity for myself as not a Muslim person. Um, so who witnesses the ways that uh, Muslim identity it moves about the world and is treated by the world. Um, with the wretched door, it's a rare opportunity to see a story where the Muslim woman prevails. Mm -hmm. And um, and in a way where it's not at the expense or opposition of everyone else, um, when the Muslim woman prevails, um, we all prevail. And to me, that's that's Muslim futures right there. So. Thank you, thank you for that. So I'm just gonna let you guys, um, if there are any other closing comments um, sort of now now would be the time to add. I just wanted to say that I'm all in for the 99 foot wretched all like just smashing stuff up. I think that's fantastic. So <laughs> I'm up for that. It's, like the, it's like the Hulk, but like, yeah. oh, maybe that's the green part, Robert. <laughs> like Hulk, Robert. green to door Hulk. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, definitely up for that. And, you know, again, this is, you know, really important work in terms of, you know, not just sort of um, within art history and, you know, Annie, you sort of bring, you know, really important points forward about the canon and it's, it's what I'm doing. Actually, my PhD is kind of rewriting, <laughs> I'm bringing a whole new element to the canon, arguing for that. Um, you know, this, it's where kind of art, history and it meets the history of humanity, um, as Gita Kapoor says, which is really essential. And, you know, again, it's 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 art and it's reality. Um, and it's just, yes, you're doing this at such a critical moment in time. And, you know, again, I'm here for the 99 foot red to door. It's just, <laughs> I can see that happening. And thank you. Yeah, yes. Inshallah, Inshallah, that's it. Yeah, ninety nine foot wretched or <laughs> I think with that, um, we're gonna call it uh, an end. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us, and um, hopefully, uh, folks are taking good notes and getting inspired um, and finding ways to support everyone's work that has gathered in this circle. Really, this I think is a really profound um, gathering of folks that I have great respect for um, in their field of specialty, but also in the ways that they have connected to not just my work, but my various communities around the world. I think that's, that's what I love. I think I've, I also speak about like the one thing that I regret in college was I never got to go and do a study abroad because I never could afford it. And now uh, I get to do it in these other ways that I have never imagined, which is traveling the world and knowing that the work is beyond America and, and really needs to be beyond that Euro-American colonial centric um, way of, of knowing and doing doing and it's America is too small uh, for where this work needs to go. So I am very grateful to be in conversation in community with you all. And I look forward to future collaborations and discussions and then just having a toast, coffee, tea, beer, wine, blood, whatever it is. Um, I look forward to that. Um, and I wish you all um, good health and prosperity and lots of and passion and continued um, agitation. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, Noor. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Thank, Thank you, Adriel. You. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Good night. Good morning. Good Thank evening. You. Good, Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Bye.